Hi, hello. I am recording the first educational video in the curriculum of political systems. Uh, this particular series of videos, so focused on political systems, is addressed to two groups of students of mine. Uh, first of all, it is addressed to the students of uh, the first year undergraduate in the course of World Political Systems. And secondly, it is addressed to the third year undergraduate uh, in the major international business. Uh, and uh, this is the course entitled The Economic Policy. So those uh, videos on political systems are supposed to be the core teaching both for the students who study political systems as such and for stu and it is supposed to be like an underlying uh, layer of knowledge of theory for students who go deeper into economic policy i will try to explain what political systems are why at all do we bother about political systems because it is important to understand why the subject matters to us in the case of each course. And, well, let's go. I don't like long introductions, so here I have shrunk myself to that small window and I will come up with the first piece of reading which will serve me to introduce the notion of political systems and that piece of reading is the constitution of Uganda. Someone could ask why Uganda and I could answer why not. Uganda is as good a case of a political systems as anything else. And we can start with Uganda, uh, just as with any other country. And uh, by that slightly jokingly statement, I have introduced a general principle of this course and a principle of my entire teaching, as a matter of fact. I like jumping between cases and I like uh, making my students used to observe many different instances of uh, the phenomenon that we study. In the case of political systems, it is just good to jump between countries, between political systems to see those nuances, because theory is essentially a generalization of empirical experience. Uh, so I want you, my students, just to have as much empirical contact with what a political system might be as possible. So let's go to Uganda. Here is the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda. Uh, to those of you who know what is a constitution, uh, just a reminder. A constitution is a set of rules uh, which are supposed to make like the foundation of the entire legal system of the given country. And here comes an important thing to understand about political systems in general. Most countries, the great majority of countries, have constitutions. Uh, there are, I think, two exceptions. One exception is uh, Great Britain, which has a constitutional law, but does not really have a constitution in the strict sense of the term. And I think another case is New Zealand. But uh, save for those uh, rare cases, most countries have written constitutions. And those constitutions have two functions, which interestingly combine in the same institution, the institution of constitution. Uh, those two functions are, first of all, to give the basic rules of the game in the political system, because the constitution is supposed to regulate 
those basic rules of the political game. And on the other hand, the Constitution is the foundation or the foundational act of the entire legal order of the country. So we have the same like, like one tool. It is as if you had a screwdriver and that screwdriver could serve you to repair, for example, a motorbike and something in, in your house. And this is really uh, what screwdrivers can be used for. And the constitutions are like a peculiar invention of, of the mankind. <clears throat> it is the invention based on a discovery that if we regulate, like formally, basic rules of the social game, if we regulate them in one document, on the basis of that document we can build a complex system of more or less formalized rules. So let's go into that constitution of Uganda. First of all, there is a preface. I am reading it just for the sake of being accurate in my reporting of facts. So this is a reprint of the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda, 1995, which was authorized by the Attorney General under the Acts of Parliament, reprint of miscellaneous enactments, Order 2006, Statutory Instrument Number 7 of 2006. That statutory instrument was issued under Section 18.1 and 2 of the Acts of Parliament Act, Capital 2. In terms of Section 18.2 of that Act, this reprint is to be judicially noticed with effect from uh, February 15, 2006, as the authentic copy. The reprint was prepared by the Uganda Law Reform Commission. And there are a few amendments on the way in that Act, one from 2000 and two from 2005. Let's go a little bit further. Here you have a little glimpse of the table of contents and you have such matters as National Objectives and Directive Principles of State Policy, Arrangement of Objectives, Arrangement of Chapters, Arrangement of Articles, then the Preamble, and then Chapters, Chapters of the Constitution. As you can see, by just by having a glance at this table of contents, you can see that in this Constitution, you have very different matters regulated and put together, like in one document. Uh, this is a, like a notable trait of many constitutions, that uh, if you read them, if you read the document of the constitution, you have very different matters regulated in it. Let's read, for example, two fragments of, uh, out of the Constitution of Uganda. So, first of all, the national objectives and directive principles of state policy. And then the preamble, page 21. First of all, the national objectives. Let's go there. National objectives and directive principles of the state of state policy, arrangement of objectives, implementation, democratic principles, national unity and stability, national sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity, fundamental and other human rights and freedoms, gender balance and fair representation of marginalized groups, protection of the age, the provision of adequate resources for organs of government, and so on. And you have a whole list of those national objectives. So this constitution looks a little bit as if it was not just a legal document, not just a collection of principles, but as if on the top of that it was a strategy for the country. Because essentially if in a document you put objectives and you assume that everything else is supposed to be aligned on those objectives, you have a strategy. Now let's go 
to page 21, to the preamble. I am scrolling quickly across those national objectives. You can see that the list is pretty long. Okay, Constitution of the Republic of Uganda, commencement October the 8th, 1995. We, the people of Uganda, recalling our history which has been characterized by political and constitutional instability, recognizing our struggles against the forces of tyranny, oppression and exploitation, committed to building a better future by establishing a socio-economic and political order through a popular and durable national constitution, based on the principles of unity, peace, equality, democracy, freedom, social justice and progress, exercising our sovereign and inalienable right to determine the form of governance for our country and having fully participated in the constitution-making process, process, I'm sorry, noting that the Constituent Assembly was established to represent us and to debate the draft constitution prepared by the Uganda Constitutional Commission and to adopt and enact a constitution for Uganda, do hereby in and through this Constituent Assembly solemnly adopt, enact and give to ourselves and our posterity this constitution of the Republic of Uganda this 22nd day of September in the year 1995. For God and my country. Interesting. Now, a general remark. In most constitutions, you will find that section which is called the preamble, where you have those very general principles, which are not really rules of conduct for anyone, but they rather serve to interpret the whole constitution. And now an important thing about political systems. In political systems, we have two very different social phenomena colliding like against each other. On the one hand, politics are a tough and brutal game. Uh, so if you read the constitution, you can very largely interpret that constitution as a set of rules for a very brutal sport like MMA uh, on steroids or bare knuckles boxing. Because this is what politics on the day-to-day -day basis are. A very brutal game, a struggle for power, uh, where you have almost no holds barred. On the other hand, a political system can be sustainable and stable only if all the parties involve, involved uh, respect some basic values, uh, basic ethical values of the society. And if you put together that very brutal political game and the necessity to have and respect really positive, uh, really inspiring ethical values, you have that strange mixture like of fire and water or fire and ice, like contradicting mechanisms. Yet, nevertheless, this is what political systems are. Political systems are uh, like a connection between that brutal fight for power and the underlying ethical principles that a society that a society needs to stay united to stay together to remain a country let's see what they write further on in that constitution of uganda national objectives and directive principles of state policy general implementation of objectives the following objectives and principles shall guide all organs and agencies of the state, all citizens, organizations and other bodies and persons, in applying or interpreting the constitution or any other law, and in taking and implementing any policy decisions for the establishment and promotion of a just, free and democratic society. The president shall report to parliament and the nation at least once a year 
all steps taken to ensure the realization of these policy objectives and principles. So here we have a constitution oriented really on principles and objectives. It is like a strategy with, a, with an ethical edge. Now we will move to another continent. So we will move out of Uganda. So I am respectfully kicking Uganda out of our window of discussion. And, I, and we move to Asia. To be more specific, we move to India. And we will study for a moment the constitution of India. Just quickly jump there. Okay, the Constitution of India as on July 31st, 2018. Government of India, Ministry of Law and Justice, Legislative Department. Here you have the table of contents of the, uh, of the Constitution. I will quickly jump through that table of contents to the preamble and the, and, and, and the first articles of the Constitution, just to have a quick comparison against that Constitution of Uganda. So just let me scroll through it quickly. So here is the preamble. I will make that print slightly bigger. Okay. We, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a, sovereign, into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic and to secure for all its citizens justice, social, economic and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. In our Constituent Assembly, this 26th day of November 1949, do hereby adopt, enact and give to ourselves this Constitution. Part 1. The Union and its Territory Name and territory of the Union. India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states. The states and the territories thereof shall be as specified in the first schedule. The territory of India shall comprise the territories of the states, the union territories specified in the first schedule, and such other territories as may be acquired. Admission or establishment of new states. Parliament may by law admit into the Union or establish new states on such terms and conditions as it thinks fit. 3. Formation of new states. Oh, by the way, here you have an Article 2a, which uh, was there but had been removed by the, by the 36th Amendment Act in 1975. So, Two, uh, ex excuse me, three, formation of new states and alteration of areas, boundaries or names of existing states. Parliament may, by law, form a new state by separation of territory from any state or by uniting two or more states or parts of, of states or by uniting any territory to a part of any state. Increase the area of any state, diminish the area of any state, alter the boundaries of any state, alter the name of any state. So, if you have a quick glance at, that, at those really first sentences, like first statements in the Constitution of India, and if you quickly compare it to the Constitution of Uganda, which we have just seen together, we have two very different beginnings, so to say. The Constitution of Uganda starts with a strong emphasis on those national objectives, on that strategy to be followed. The Constitution of India, on the other hand, 
starts with the definition of the territory and as you can see it gives to the parliament of india like large powers in shaping the territory of the country both in its external boundaries and in its internal structure now there comes a, a general principle which i follow very frequently when i explain to my students any kind of legal act and constitution is a legal act in legal acts people put rules which are important to them if in uganda the constitution starts with the rules pertinent to national objectives to that national strategy it means that for the i think i am going to call them correctly that for the ugandians uh, what really matters in the first place is to align all the resources of the country around like a national strategy of development on the other hand if you see india or that commencement of the constitution of india what matters most of all is the territory the land and its structure and the sovereignty of the federal country over that land by the way uh, when in the constitution of india you read that india that is bharat shall be a union of states it means that it is a federal state okay so you have those two cases you can see two like two glimpses of two political systems uh, on two different continents, in two very different social, economic and political and historical contexts. Now let's see a little bit of theory. I will start with like old school theory. We'll do a little bit of reading into articles published in the general topic of uh, political systems in the late 1950s, so essentially uh, when the division between the communist systems and the market-based democratic systems was already very pronounced in the world. So I kick out the Constitution of India from our window of video and I go to the first article of the two uh, give me just one second okay in a moment you will see the title just let me reposition that uh, window of the article in the window of the video okay the title is Comparative Political Systems by Gabriel Almond. As you can see, the date of publication, it was 1956, so long ago. It is practically, oh, it is 64 years ago. Uh, and let's see what those people in the, in the late 1950s, what, what scholars uh, in the late 1950s, were thinking about comparative political systems. What I propose to do in this brief paper is to suggest how the application of certain sociological and anthropological concepts may facilitate systematic comparison among the major types of political systems operative in the world today. At the risk of saying the obvious, I am not suggesting to my colleagues in the field of comparative government that social theory is a conceptual cure-all for the ailments of the discipline. There are many ways of laboring in the, in, in the vineyard of the Lord, and I am quite prepared to concede that there are more musical forms of psalmody than sociological jargon. I suppose the test of the sociological approach that is discussed here is whether or not it enables us to solve certain persistent problems in the field more effectively then we now are able to solve them. Now, as a general commentary on the context of this article, what was like the puzzle or the headache of 
political scholars over decades was why is there so many different political systems? And on the other hand, why is that that certain very particular political solutions or political mechanisms just work and why some others just don't? No? So why we have those recurrent patterns in an otherwise very disparate, very differentiated map of political systems. Let's read further. Our expectations of the field of comparative government have changed in at least two ways in the last decades. In the first place, as American interests have broadened to include literally the whole world, our course offerings have expanded to include the, the many areas outside of Western Europe. Asia, the Middle East, Africa and Latin America. Secondly, as our international interests have expanded and become more urgent, our requirements in knowledge have become more exacting. We can no longer view political crises in France with detached curiosity or view countries such as Indochina and Indonesia as interesting political pathologies. We are led to extend our discipline and intensify it simultaneously. Another commentary from my part. The science of political systems has or had arisen very much as a practical science. Uh, understanding how a different political system works is simply important for maintaining international relations with the given country. We need to understand what they care for and what they are after and how their political system works in order, for example, to instruct our ambassador how he or she sh should behave there. It will simply be untrue to say that the discipline of comparative government has not begun to meet both of these challenges. As rapidly as it has been possible to train the personnel, new areas have been opened up to teaching and research. And there has been substantial encouragement to those who have been tempted to explore new aspects of the political process, both here and abroad, and to employ new methods in such research. It is precisely because of the eagerness and energy with which these challenges have been met that the field is now confronted with the problem of systematic accumulation and comparison. What appears to be required in view of the rapid expansion of the field are more comparative efforts in the tradition of Feiner and Friedrich, if we have to gain the maximum in insight and knowledge from this large-scale research effort. Okay, this is one take. This is one piece of theory. Maybe in this specific video I will return to it. Now I would like to jump to another article, which was published just one year later. So we kick Professor Almond, of course, respectfully out of our window and we invite another professor, Professor Easton. Here we are. Let me just switch on my computer to that article by Easton. So here we have an article published in 1957, so one year later after uh, uh, the one that we have just been reading. An approach to the analysis of political systems. Let's see a different point of view. Some attributes of political systems. In an earlier work I have argued for the need to develop general, empirically oriented theory as the most economical way in the long run to understand the political life. Here I propose to indicate a point of view that, at the least, might serve as a springboard for discussion of alternative approaches and, at most, as a small step in the direction of a general political theory. I wish to stress that what I have to say is a mere orientation to the problem of theory. Outside of economics and perhaps psychology, it would be pre presumptuous to call very much in social science theory, in the strict sense of the term. 
Furthermore, I shall offer only a gestalt of my point of view so that it will be possible to evaluate in the light of the whole those parts that I do stress. In doing this, I know I run the definite risk that the meaning and implications of this point of view may be only superficially communicated. But it is a risk I shall have to undertake since I do not know how to avoid it sensibly. The study of politics is concerned with understanding how authoritative decisions are made and executed for a society. We can try to understand political life by viewing each of its aspects piecemeal. We can examine the operation of such institutions as political parties, interest groups, government and voting. We can study the nature and consequences of such political practices as manipulation, propaganda and violence. We can seek to reveal the structure with which these practices occur. By combining the results, we can obtain a rough picture of what happens in any self-contained political unit. In combining these results, however, there is already implicit the notion that each part of the larger political canvas does not stand alone, but is related to each other part. Or, to put it positively, that the operation of no one part can be fully understood without reference to the way in which the whole itself operates. I have suggested in my book, The Political System, that it is valuable to adopt this implicit assumption as an articulate premise for research and to view political life as a system of interrelated activities. These activities derive their relatedness or systemic ties from the fact that uh, they all more or less influence the way, the way in which authoritative decisions are formulated and executed for a society. Okay, so now we have those two points of view, Professor Almond and Professor Easton. Uh, I temporarily and still re respectfully ask Professor Easton out of our video, and I go once again to the constitution of Uganda to sort of illustrate those principles or those issues which I have just signaled uh, by giving a short reading from those articles. So let's go back to Uganda. Just let me quickly jump over the top corner of the document and we will continue. So we have those rules that we stopped at uh, in the previous reading. Implementation of objectives. I will read it once again with a different take and I will explain you the mental gymnastics uh, or the intellectual gymnastics that we can now perform with those rules. The following objectives and principles shall guide all organs and agencies of the state, all citizens, organizations and other bodies and persons in applying or interpreting the constitution or any other law and in taking and implementing any policy decisions for the establishment and promotion of a just, free and democratic society. I return to the principle that whatever is to be found in a constitution is important to people who live in that country. On the other hand, from those articles that I have just given you a glimpse of, so the article by Professor Almond and the one by Professor Easton, we can read that a political system is really a system. So if you see a rule, a principle, to written in the Constitution, it is very low, it is very likely to be like broadly branched into different areas of social and economic life. Each principle, each rule in the Constitution is supposed to have very strong systemic attachment to other rules. How to know? How to, let's say, how to guess those branchings and those attachments? Let's take that article Roman uh, capital one, Roman small i, the following objectives and principles and so on. So we focus on this specific article. I will highlight the text just to be sure that we know what we are talking about. Now, let's suppose 
that we just remove this specific article, this specific paragraph from the Constitution. So let's suppose that there is no mention whatsoever in the Constitution of the necessity of guiding all organs and agencies of the state with the following objectives and principles. It means that those objectives and principles of state policy become sort of an addition, like an addendum to national policies. And they don't really matter. They can be followed or they don't have to be followed. It's a, it, it is sort of uh, as suits to each separate political agent. Okay? And now let's do something apparently ridiculous. So let's uh, put a negation form in that sentence. I will make a speech bubble here, a small one, and I will just modify this sentence as follows shall not guide. As I said, it looks strange, but it serves to illustrate like a principle uh, or let's say a methodological principle in studying legal acts. So now let's try to reread this paragraph with that speech bubble added. The following objectives and principles shall not guide all organs and agencies of the state, all citizens, organizations and other bodies and persons, and so on and so on. Now, if we read that sentence in a negative form, uh, it is more ambiguous than the baseline phrasing. Because if we say that those objectives and principles shall guide all organs, etc., it is clear. Hmm? It is a strategy. But if we turn it into a negative form, uh, we, can, uh, we don't exactly know what it would be like when the following objectives and principles do not guide all organs and agencies of the state. Does it mean that those principles and objectives are simply not binding but interesting to follow? Or are they like to avoid at all cost? So whatever we do, we should act in exact opposition to those objectives and principles. It is an important trick or an important hint about studying legal texts and constitutions. Positive statements are usually more precise and more unequivocal than negative statements. This is why in legal acts included in constitutions, we, you will rather find legal rules formulated in the positive form than in the negative form. Let's try the same kind of intellectual gymnastics with the Constitution of India, just to get the hang of that general method. So for the moment I get rid of uh, the Constitution of Uganda and I bring up the Constitution of India once again. Give me a second to go to the Constitution of India. Give me another second to jump over the top of the document and... Let's go. The Union and its territory. The states and the territories thereof shall be as specified in the first schedule. The territory of India shall comprise the territories of the states, the Union territories specified in the first schedule, and such other territories as may be acquired. In the present phrasing, 
that article gives to the government of India a lot of flexibility uh, in, the, let's say, the, the, the shaping of the national territory. By the way, that section 1.3c means that essentially India, as a sovereign country, can acquire any external territory and can sort of self-proclaim itself sovereign over that acquired territory. So it is like a regulation of conquest. And now let's do that negative thing just to, to play around a little bit. So I add a speech bubble here. And I will apport the following modification. Shall not comprise the territories of the states. Sorry, I meant <laughs> not set as states. Okay. So instead of reading the territory of India shall comprise the territories of the states, we would have a sentence which say the territory of India shall not comprise the territories of the states. It would be a weird situation uh, when uh, the territory of the federal state does not really apply or it does not really cover the territories of the member states. I think there is just one case across the world which I know. It is the case of Tanzania. In Tanzania or inside Tanzania you have a, like a strange political entity, the island of Zanzibar. And the island of Zanzibar is essentially a self-proclaimed republic of Zanzibar. And whilst the Republic of Zanzibar proclaims to be completely sovereign and independent of any other country, yet the constitution of Tanzania recognizes the existence of the Republic of Zanzibar inside Tanzania. But save for those very like rare cases, there is a principle which I introduce now, the principle of the unity of national territory. A country, in order to be recognized as a sovereign country, must be able to control a definite territory. And this is one of the criteria of sovereignty. So whatever you read in any constitution, whatever you have in the political system, the political system of any given country has to work so as the government of the country can effectively control the territory of the country. There has to be like a systemic match between the territory as defined in the constitution and the capacity of the government to control that territory. Okay, that would be all in that first uh, video uh, in the first video educational on political systems. It is the first one in a series. If you want to tell me your impressions and your remarks about it. And until the next video, I wish you a nice day. It is actually a Sunday, so I wish you a nice Sunday afternoon. And generally have fun with science and have fun with life. <laughs>